<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. And welcome to this Ophir Photonics Group webinar. My name is Mark Slutsky. I'm the product manager for power and energy measurement solutions here at the Ophir Photonics Group. And thanks for joining us today. Uh, the topic, well, you know the topic. Uh, we're going to be reviewing the basic technical principles behind photonic measurements behind laser measurements of the various types. Um, just maybe some logistical notes before we continue. The total time of today's webinar will be something like 55 to 57 minutes. Um, maybe by way of introduction, although as mentioned, I, I guess I have an advantage and a disadvantage in the fact that I'm a native English speaker. The advantage is that it comes easily to me and I can speak very quickly. The disadvantage is that it comes easily to me and I can speak very quickly. Um, the disadvantage would be to everybody who isn't necessarily a native English speaker. There's a heck of a lot of material here that I've put a lot of effort into cramming into less than an hour. Uh, the price to be paid for that is that I'm going to kind of go a little bit quickly. I will try to speak as clearly as I can. Questions, comments are welcome and even encouraged using the text chat box on the right side of the screen. Um, I'll do my best to respond uh, uh, either in real time or at a suitable point in the flow of the information, depending on the nature and the timing of the questions. I will be leaving my contact information at my email address on the final slide for a couple of minutes after we conclude. So if you want to contact me offline, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, you can also contact me, us, uh, through our website. On every page of our website, there is some kind of a contact us form. Um, you can contact us through our, you can speak to our partners in your various countries. Uh, if you don't know who they are, then on our website, there's a contact us page. Contact us on the, uh, I believe it's the right mo right hand most item on the top main menu um, and you can go by country and find out who to speak to who Ophir's representative or the Ophir office in your various countries. I'll probably be repeating this last bit somewhere later on in the course of our discussion. Um, and uh, okay, so with all of that out of the way, let's begin. This is a topic that we do a webinar on pretty much once a year. Um, it's certainly most of our webinars are like 45 minutes long. This one is close to an hour, as I said, because there's a lot of material. Uh, I hope I found the right balance between broad coverage of the topic and going into depth. Our goal here is not to turn anyone into an in a measurement instrument design engineer. The idea here is that the better you understand the principles behind laser measurements, the better you'll be at choosing the right equipment to do the measurements that you need to do, the better you'll be at using it. And if something isn't clear and if you need help, the better you'll be at knowing what kind of questions to ask. Uh, so whether you're experienced, seasoned users of laser measurement equipment, or you're just beginning to feel the need to get some kind of hardware, software to do what you need it to do when it comes to measurements, I hope that this webinar will give you um, as much understanding as possible. Uh, from our point of view, the better the customer understands what they need, the more confident we are that we're giving them the right thing, either we or, God forbid, somebody else, uh, which leads me to another point. I'm Because our goal here, this is not a sales thing, or it's not a sales pitch. Our goal here is definitely, as I said, to you know, help provide as much information as possible um, to users or potential users uh, of you know, laser measurement solutions. Um, I've done everything I could to keep the information as generic as possible. When having said that, when it comes to specific examples of equipment, obviously I will be using Ophir equipment because that's the equipment that I'm qualified to speak about. Uh, so hopefully everything will be seen in that light. Okay, so with all of that, let's begin. I assume you're familiar with Ophir to some extent. Either you're already using Ophir solutions or you're considering or whatever it is. Uh, Ophir is part of the MKS um, company. We were acquired a number of years back. Uh, basically, best way I think I can summarize this is that we like to do the hard stuff. 
uh, so that you can focus on what you want to be doing and not worry about the tools you need to do it. I think that's a pretty decent summary. So here's what we're going to be covering. Um, first, a very brief overview of what parameters we provide measurement solutions for, a brief review of why it's important to measure. Sometimes, to be honest, you'll be surprised hearing this from me, sometimes it may not be so important to measure. So we'll just very, very briefly talk about these two points. Then we'll talk about, you know, get into the meat and potatoes of what we're here to discuss. And that's how we measure the principles behind all of these measurements. Um, first, we'll do a high altitude overview. I like these images. And then we'll dig down, get into the lower altitude uh, and get into the more detailed discussions of the principles behind the different types of measurements. And again, not in any kind of engineering detail, but hopefully just enough detail to provide you with the insights and understanding that'll help you without hopefully without boring you too much and taking up your time unnecessarily. Um, and then we'll end off with a little bit about meters. Um, most of our discussion will be about the sensors. I'm going to explain all of this now or in about a minute. Um, and at the end, I will just be briefly, I'll briefly conclude by pointing you in the direction of further information if you want to explore any of the topics uh, in a little bit more detail. Again, you can, of course, contact me offline, contact us offline, uh, but I will point you in the direction of resources um, on our website where you can get more information. Um, okay, so first of all, what we measure, the parameters. Uh, how to structure the sentence, the parameters, the measurement of which we provide solutions for, I, th I think I did that right, okay, no. we provide measurement instruments to measure these parameters, okay, that's the right way to, and then I'm going to explain each of these, laser beam, energy, power, beam size, and beam position, and temporal pulse characterization, the temporal pulse shape. We also have a very extensive, very advanced line of beam profiling solutions. That's a whole subject in, in itself. Um, we will not really be covering that in this discussion. There are other people who are far more expert in that than I am, and we actually do host webinars on that topic every now and then. From the uh, Spiricon and Photon brands, uh, we have lots of really smart guys who give separate, dis who, you know, who lead separate discussions on that. So I'm just mentioning it for the sake of completeness, but uh, you're basically not really going to hear more about that from me during this, uh, this webinar. Um, okay. Part two, why we measure. Um, okay. So imagine that, you know, there's some laser based eye surgical system and the engineer who's designing it. It's usually not an engineer. It's usually a team, but whatever just figured, well, you know, the laser manufacturer, the manufacturer of the laser that's at the heart of this system, well, you know, provide the data sheet with their laser and the sheet, that data sheet says that the laser produces, you know, this much power, this much energy, whatever. So, okay, I, says the engineer, can rely on that data sheet and I'll build my system around that. Um, now, let's say, God forbid, you need eye surgery. How comfortable would you be um, putting your eyeball under that system? Uh, probably not very, all right? If you don't measure it, you don't control it. The engineer who's designing the system assumes based on somebody else's data sheet that if he pumps this much current or that much voltage or whatever it is through the laser, it's going to produce this much power, this much energy. Well, what if it doesn't? So I trust that in a forum like this, I don't need to uh, belabor that point. And the same goes for less dramatic things where it's not your eyeball that needs to be subject to that beam, but industrial process control or whatever. There it's merely a whole bundle of money that might get lost if the laser doesn't produce what the process thinks that the laser is going to produce. Uh, so I trust that that point has been made and we'll now move on to the second section. Um, okay, the other sections won't be quite as quick. I, again, I trust that in a form like this, I don't need to belabor these points too much. So now let's begin discussing how we measure. We're going to look at the different mechanisms that are used for different types of measurements, and then we'll look at the basic sensor types that are based on those mechanisms. And then because we understand the mechanisms, we'll be able to appreciate what sensor types would be used for what kind of measurements, what their limitations are, and so on. 
typical measurement system. Back in my military days, the instructors always used to tell us that everything in the universe is made of three parts. Uh, so we're going to go with that. Uh, the three parts of a typical, any generic measurement system are a sensor, which is the transducer. That's the front end or the, the end, the side that's facing the thing that we're trying to measure. In our case, that's a laser beam. Then some kind of processing. And then there's an output. Okay, simple enough. So with that in mind, let's now begin to understand the parameters that we're trying to measure. Um, we'll begin with pulse energy. Um, energy, for our purposes, we can sort of informally define that is the potential capacity to do work. So just to give you a, an idea, one joule, which is the typical MKS, I don't mean our company, I mean uh, meter, kilogram, second system of units. Um, one joule is the energy needed to raise the temperature of about a quarter of a gram of water by one degree Celsius. So if you want an image, you can think of a container with a fixed quantity of liquid inside it. Now, I might have a laser beam consisting of a series of pulses. Each pulse may have the same or may have a different quantity of energy in it. And for my application, I might be interested, for example, in measuring the energy in every one of those pulses individually. So you can think of that same image, a whole sequence of containers, each of which has possibly a different quantity of liquid in it. And I may need to know how much liquid is in each one of those containers specifically. Or I may have a series of pulses, but I may not really be interested for my application uh, in knowing what the energy of each one of those pulses, I may only be interested for my needs in knowing the overall average rate of flow of energy per second. So I couldn't quite find the clip art that I wanted, so I kind of made my own. So I may have a repetitive series of pulses. Um, and if I'm only interested in the rate of flow of energy, then that is what we call power. A watt is one joule per second. So my, my, laser beam might consist of a sequence of pulses. Let's say each pulse is, has one joule of energy, and these pulses may be coming in at a pulse rate of one joule per second, one hertz. So my average power is one joule per second or one watt. Or I may have a continuous beam that's not pulsed at all. Here's the bit of clip art that I kind of had to make my own. Um, so here, of course, we can't really speak about energy. We can only speak about the rate of flow because all there is is flow. There's no fixed quantity. So when it comes to a continuous beam, I'm not really talking about energy. I'm only talking about power. I should just mention that in some applications, uh, the users typically refer to peak power. What we mean in our segment of the industry by peak power is the instantaneous power during the course of a pulse. So for example, if we go back to that one joule pulse that's coming in once per second, um, my average power is, as we said, one joule per second or one watt. But if we zoom in on one of those pulses, that pulse, let's say that pulse is one millisecond long. That's a pretty typical pulse length in many industrial applications, let's say. So during the course of that millisecond, my instantaneous power or peak power, as we call it, is not one joule per second. It's one joule per millisecond. So the peak power during the pulse is one joule per millisecond or one kilowatt. Okay? So I have peak power during the pulse of a kilowatt, but an average power of one watt. If you remember that, that could help you avoid a lot of confusion. So let's just get all this straight. If we can be clear on this one slide, I don't know, uh, half the questions that we get, even from experienced users, are taken care of. So just quickly, putting this all together, energy per pulse is measured in joules. Uh, average power is the rate of flow of joules, joules per second or watts. We also mentioned peak power, which is the rate of flow of joules or watts, but during the course of one pulse, the instantaneous power. Not at all the same thing as you saw, Pico, uh, sorry, kilowatt, watt, and so on. Energy density is energy per unit area incident on a surface. Um, 
too many joules per square centimeter could damage a surface. Now, in many applications, we want a lot of joules per square centimeter because those applications might involve drilling holes or, you know, burning numbers, you know, serial numbers into metal or cutting or drilling. So there we're going to focus a whole lot of joules per unit area because we want to zap the metal. When we're measuring that beam, we don't want to do that because enough joules per square centimeter to drill holes through aluminum will probably also drill holes through the sensor. It's going to be the same number of joules whether we measure in focus or out of focus. But if we want to use that sensor more than once, then we don't want to measure in focus. We want to measure slightly outside the focus so that the sensor can survive the experience. The maximum number of joules per square centimeter that a given sensor can handle, uh, we generally refer to in the specifications as the damage threshold. I'm calling this the energy damage threshold because too many watts per square centimeter can also damage materials. Each material has its own damage threshold. So there's two kinds of damage threshold, really. There's too many joules per square centimeter, even if the pulses are coming in slowly, so there aren't too many watts per square centimeter, but even one pulse that's focused too small can cause damage, and too many watts per square centimeter is also a damage threshold. We'll call that the maximum power density damage threshold. Okay, so those are the parameters of interest right now. We use two main physical mechanisms to take care of all of these measurements. One, um, oh, I should just mention that uh, power density and energy density, I'm mentioning them because those may be the parameter of interest in a lot of applications. Uh, those involving diverging beams, such as LEDs that are used for UV curing of adhesives or paints or something like that. Um, the power density, when it comes to LEDs, we usually call it irradiance, um, or the cumulative deposited energy density <clears throat> may be the critical parameter in those processes. So in those processes, the users gen you'll generally know what kind of energy density or power density you're dealing with. Okay, so as we mentioned, two main physical mechanisms. One is the semiconductor. Um, photons of light come in. Um, the nature of that material is such that an electrical current goes out. I've skipped a lot of stages in between. Um, you'll hopefully forgive me for that. The second is heat absorption. And here we're not using semiconductors whose atomic structure is such that photons get absorbed and create uh, charge separations, which we can then turn into a current. Here it's kind of a little bit more uh, brute force, I guess. Um, light gets absorbed by some kind of an opaque material and gets turned into heat. That heat gets detected and converted into an electrical voltage, which we can measure actually in our instruments. We generally convert that voltage to current, never mind why, it's for technical reasons, and then we measure the current. That voltage, current, whatever, I'll just keep talking about voltage, is going to be proportional to the power of the beam that came in. And we're going to further subdivide that into two types of heat detectors, and you'll see why in a moment. One is the thermoelectric detector, where we use two bimetal junctions, and a temperature difference between them is what creates the, that voltage, the voltage signal. And the other is the pyroelectric detector. Um, where a temperature difference between two points, between two sides of a particular kind of crystal will create that voltage difference, which we can measure because it's proportional to, and so on and so on. Um, as we're gonna see in a second, that's the pyroelectric is useful only for pulses. It only responds to changes, transients. It does not respond to steady state. Each one has its pluses, minuses, and let's have a look at some of those. And then we'll understand why you'd use one for some kinds of measurement and why you'd use the other for other kinds of measurement. When we're choosing a sensor, we need to consider all kinds of different parameters. The first and most important one is what am I trying to measure? Okay, am I trying to measure power? Am I trying to measure peak power? Am I trying to measure the energy of a single pulse? Let's say in some welding applications, I fire one pulse, check the results, and then I may fire another pulse. Um, or do I need to measure energy per pulse, but of a repetitively pulsed beam? 
where the pulses are coming in at one hertz or one kilohertz or 20 kilohertz or whatever. I need to consider what kind of power level and or energy level I'm talking about. Am I involved in an industrial process that uses tens of kilowatts? Am I using, you know, some kind of a, you know, am I involved in some kind of a scientific, uh, you know, research application where I'm trying to measure picowatts? You know, sensors that are good for one are obviously not going to be good for the other. What spectral region am I involved with? Uh, different materials will absorb light of different wavelengths differently. Um, what kind of power density or energy density is my sensor going to be exposed to? Can I control that? So even if my application involves focusing a beam down to drill holes in, in you know, in aluminum, uh, or you know, cut uh, you know, cut silicon wafers, and you know, um, but do I need to place my sensor in the focal plane? Usually, I don't really need to. I certainly don't want to. If I am involved with a pulse beam, what's the pulse length? What's the repetition rate? All of these things are going to affect my choice of sensor. Um, and if I cut corners and only consider partial information, then I shouldn't be surprised if I choose a sensor that is going to end up not working or getting damaged. So you want to be careful not to cut corners and consider all the parameters that need to be taken into account when I'm choosing a sensor. Don't panic. Um, most of that work is done for you. We have an online tool that we call the Sensor Finder. Um, you can use it online or and or you can download it. Uh, and it asks you the for the parameters, the beam size, the you know the wavelength, all all the things that it must know in order to propose the right sensor. And then you click on the Find Sensor button, and it'll give you a list of solutions that will be able to do the job. Um, as I said, you can do it online, you can download it uh, and and do it offline. And we have a variation of it for diverging beams. If you're involved with LEDs, we call that the Advanced Sensor Finder. There's links to all of these down here. You probably can't read what it says, but you know, you'll be able to do that. We also have something we call the meter finder to help you select the right meter, display, whatever you want to call it. That's a little bit different. It's more of a comparison table. The differences between meters, as we'll see, are more functional as opposed to technical. But the differences between sensors are technical and physical. The wrong choice of sensor might not work, and it might even end up using, you know, giving, you know, you might end up with a sensor that's going to get damaged depending on just how wrong the choice was. The wrong choice of meter just means maybe, you know, the, the functions might not be the ones that you wanted to be able to use. Uh, how do you find the sensor finder? On our website, the front page of the Ophir Photonics Group, on the main menu at top, support, you click on support, and then product search tools sensor finder. Also at the bottom of the page, I couldn't squish all of that onto a slide. Uh, there's, all, there's direct links uh, to mm -hmm. the sensor finder as well. There's the meter finder and so on. Um, OK, moving right along. Um, I'm going to just ask everyone to please make sure that you do remain muted for I have a uh, a, uh, a function here that's supposed to mute automatically, um, but every now and then I keep hearing voices. Maybe it's only me. Maybe my problem is entirely different. Okay. Now let's uh, drop down to a lower altitude. Enough with the SR-71 Blackbird. Now let's uh, switch to the drone. And uh, if you remember that opening slide that I had there, and let's get into the more detailed technical principles. How are we with time? Okay, we're more or less on track. Let's begin with general power sensors for moderate to high power levels from a couple of tens of microwatts up to 120 kilowatts in our case. Uh, here you see a family portrait of a few representative uh, members of that family, you see different sizes of aperture. You can kind of make out that different absorbers. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Um, you may be wondering why one would use such an indirect mechanism as heat absorption. Again, technical reasons, it has its pluses and its minuses. One of the first words you learn in any engineering uh, curriculum at university is trade-off. So there's lots of trade-offs involved here. I, I'm only going to touch on the ones that are helpful to a potential user like yourselves, presumably, to, to be clear on. Basically, 
dissimilar metals, bimetallic, okay, metal A, metal B, metal A again, uh, suitably chosen metal A and metal B, and suitably connected um, has a physical principle that says that if there is a temperature difference between these two points, uh, there's going to be a voltage difference between them as well. By the way, that works in the opposite direction as well. If we impose a voltage difference that will produce a temperature difference, we can use that to electronically, digitally control the temperature of something very precisely. That's used in a lot of uh, imaging, thermal imaging cameras to control the to precisely control the temperature of the focal plane array. We use it in the detection direction. So there is a temperature difference because we're absorbing a laser beam. Uh, that's going to create a voltage difference, and the voltage is proportional to the power, meaning to the heat flow that <coughs> caused, <coughs> excuse me, that temperature difference. The proportion, sorry, the constant of proportion, we measure that when we calibrate the instrument, so that by knowing this, we then can allow you to not only know that the temperature is going up or going down, but you can actually get a measurement of absolute power by measuring the by measuring the voltage. So that's what we do. We calibrate 100% of the instruments that come out the door, so that it, when it's in your hands, it'll give you an actual reading in numbers and not just tell you in uh, in uh, relative terms. Oh, power's going up or power's going down. Two different configurations of these. Most of our sensors are based on a radial configuration where the beam is absorbed somewhere in the center of this circle. And here we have a series of metal A, metal B, metal A, metal B. We want a series of them because the voltage that's produced here is generally pretty small, a very small fraction of a microvolt or a millivolt per watt of incoming power. So we want to give it a slightly more useful voltage. So we have a whole bunch of these. This is schematic. So the laser beam gets absorbed on the backside. In other words, in this image, the beam would be coming from behind your screen. And then the resulting heat spreads radially outwards. And the instrument will measure the difference between the temperature of the inner hotter circle and the outer cooler circle. We measure it at the two ends of that series. Uh, and we measure the voltage signal. There's a little resistor here I mentioned earlier that we convert that into current. And what we're measuring is the current. But OK, we're not going to get into that right now. So one configuration is the radial configuration. All of this stuff, by the way, is hidden behind the front mechanical flange of the sensor body. So only this is the active aperture of the sensor. The other configuration is an axial configuration where the heat flows front to back are, are more sensitive sensors. The ones that go down to maybe 10 microwatts are based on this. Again, never mind why. It's much more sensitive. It's a little bit slower. Everything has its pluses and its minuses. This is what a typical disk would look like. Here we're looking at the thermopile side, at the back side. So again, the beam would be coming towards you from behind the plane of your screen. And this, what we're looking at here, is the side of the disk that's inside the sensor body. Here's a metal A, metal B, metal A, metal B, and so on and so on. And here we have the leads going out into the rest of the sensor, into the electronics. A whole bunch of uh, design considerations here. Uh, the material that the disk is made of needs to have good thermal conductivity so the heat that's being produced can be removed as quickly as possible to make room for more. Uh, if heat comes in faster than it goes out, the temperature is going to start to rise. And somewhere at around 120 degrees Celsius or so, the first point of failure would be a disconnect at one or several of these junctions. And that would result in instant sensor death. Uh, for lower powers, we make the disks out of aluminum. Higher powers, we use copper, has better uh, thermal characteristics, but it's more expensive. So we don't use it until we're talking about power levels where we need to. We have to make it thin. Again, we're not getting into the engineering details, but a whole lot of stuff goes into the design of these things. A lot of stuff goes into the design of these things. I should stress that. Um, so when we measure average power, here, the beam, at, this, at this point in time, the laser beam gets turned on. Um, the beam arrives at the absorber surface of the, of the disk of the sensor, gets turned into heat. The heat starts to spread. Sometime later, the leading edge of that heat begins to arrive at that ring of thermopile detectors. 
uh, and its output signal then begins to go up. Okay, so there's going to be some kind of a response time. It's not instantaneous. The response time of such a sensor depends, you know, it's a function of the physical thermal profile, and we're talking about a second or seconds. So typically it could be four or five seconds, depending on how massive the disk is, what power it's designed, that sensor is designed for. We speed that up a little bit because the shape of that curve is characteristic of a given sensor, of its thermal profile. So once we measure that one time as part of our calibration process, then we have a predictive algorithm in the instrument that already by the time, next time when it's in your hands and you're using it, by the time the signal goes around a third of the way up, we already know where it's going to end off. So it'll display the readout long before that uh, physical response time is over. So the physical response time might look like this, four or five seconds. After one, two, two and a half seconds, um, the instrument will already give a reading. We can measure energy. We can't really measure the energy of repetitively pulsed beams because, as we just saw, the physical time constant of these sensors is on the order of seconds. So if we're using a beam where pulses are coming in at 10 hertz, the sensor has no physical way of knowing that we're talking about pulses at all. But if we fire one pulse, then what's going to happen is here's the one pulse. It starts, it ends, the heat spreads. Sometime later, the heat reaches starts to reach the sensors, the signal goes up, maximizes, and then starts to drop back down until the trailing edge of that heat pulse moves past the sensor, and then it's back down to zero. The integral, the area under the curve, is the total amount of energy that was in that pulse. I, last time I had to solve an integral was probably a little bit over 30 years ago. Goodness gracious me. Um, the instrument does the integration for you. Um, so this is what we call measuring single shot energy. If you fire another pulse before this is finished happening, then it won't know that the pulse ended. And at best, it'll think it's one long pulse and it'll give you the total energy in the two pulses combined. In less than best cases, it might give you nonsense. So you want to wait until the instrument flashes the word ready and then you can fire another pulse. Um, it doesn't matter how short the pulse is, by the way, because the heat got absorbed and it begins to move and we measure that. Um, we can use that to measure higher powers than the sensor itself might be thermally rated for, because what we can do is expose the sensor to a higher power than it would like to be exposed to, but only for a very short exposure time. So it doesn't have time to overheat. And then we treat that, ex that short exposure as if it were one long pulse. We measure the energy of that pulse as if we're dealing with regular single shot energy mode. And since we control the pulse, if we know how long that pulse was, we can divide, or much better, we can ask the instrument to divide the energy by the time, energy per time, that's power. We actually have a whole bunch of sensors that are specifically designed with very high energy scales so that they can be used for this in practical industrial applications. In our um, product section, we have a whole subsection called high power measurement from short exposures. And we've got a number of instruments that are designed to do that. This is on our website. We have, as I mentioned, a bunch of sensors that were specifically given very high energy scales, like 10 kilojoules, exactly for this purpose. And some of our newest instruments, specifically, now I'm mentioning Ophir instruments, the Star Bright meter, the Centauri touchscreen meter uh, are designed specifically to work in that mode. They'll prompt you to enter the exposure time, the pulse width, and then it'll measure the energy and it'll output the power. Um, so you can use this to measure very high powers. Of course, you'll need to wait before doing it again for the heat to get dissipated. But in many applications, that's fine. And then we have the Helios, which is designed specifically for that kind of work in an automated uh, you know, production floor network and let's say automotive, produ automotive uh, production floors where it's not displaying anything at all. It's uh, integrated into a fa factory floor network and the central server is controlling everything. Okay, the absorber, 
that's used in a given sensor determines the spectral range of the sensor. As we mentioned, different materials absorb different wavelengths differently. And also the durability, given sensor material can handle a given maximum power density or energy density. On our website, in the catalog, in the data sheets, we've got the spectral, relative spectral sensitivities of different, uh, absor different sensors, different absorber types. The body of the sensor determines the maximum power for which it can be rated because different type of sensor bodies can dissipate heat faster or slower. We have two main types of absorbers. Um, and these are used for short pulses or, well, these are used for long pulses and for short pulses. What do I mean? Let's say we have a very short pulse with an energy density of one joule per square centimeter. So by the time the end of that very short pulse comes, let's say a nanosecond pulse, a Q-switch laser, all the heat that was generated by absorbing that one joule per square centimeter has not had time to move anywhere into the thickness of the material. All of that heat is concentrated in a very thin layer of surface material. The material better be able to handle it, otherwise it could get damaged. Um, there are ex you know, exotic slash expensive absorber materials that can handle very high energy or power de energy densities, but not always do you want to have to do that. So we have a different type of absorber called a volume absorber. A good example and a commonly used one is neutral density absorptive glass. All right, and it absorbs <laughs> light incrementally as the light moves through this partially transparent material so that even an extremely short pulse the heat is going to be distributed through a much thicker layer of material. So you don't have one layer of material that has to contain all of this heat. Um, uh, oh, sorry, here's the forward button. If you want an image of light being absorbed incrementally as it moves through material, I love this image. This is one of my sons and I around 12 meters down um, off the coast of Eilat, uh, southern tip of Israel. I, th I believe it's uh, the northernmost coral reef in the world. Absolutely beautiful scuba diving location. That's one of my passions in life. This is, I, I think this is an incredibly cool picture. Um, so here you see the light coming down and as the light moves through the water, it's being incrementally, ab incrementally absorbed. If I were located in America, I would now be able to, you know, uh, count that uh, scuba diving trip uh, as a business expense, but I, we don't have rules like that here in Israel, but I still think it's an incredibly cool image. Um, so some of our sensors are based on surface absorbers and some are based on volume absorbers. There's pluses and minuses. Again, volume absorbers are really good at very short pulses with high energy density, but they're not very good at high average powers and so on. There's always, always trade-offs. Again, the sensor finder will do most of the thinking for you. There are many ways, I've mentioned damage, there are many ways of damaging a sensor. The two main ones are too much um, power or too much energy. No measurement device likes being overloaded. Uh, and another way is even if you have not so much power or energy, but even a little bit of power focused down to a small enough spot will very likely burn a hole through the sensor material, just like it's probably meant to burn a hole through the workpiece in the industrial application that it's designed for. Um, I've heard stories from other people, of course, of mischievous little boys who are destined to grow up to become physicists or engineers going out into their garden. So I've heard from other people, only from other people, of course, and taking a magnifying glass and focusing sunlight, which is a not terribly high power level. We enjoy playing out in the sun and focusing that down onto a small enough spot to go beyond the damage threshold of innocent little insects crawling through the grass until they go puff and a puff of steam. Uh, so I've heard from other people. So even moderate power levels focused down to a small enough spot can do damage. And many of our applications do that on purpose, but we don't want to do that to the sensor. And again, it's the same number of watts here as here. So we don't want to measure here. We want to measure here or at least somewhere in this area, usually. In our beam profiling solutions, there are applications that want to see what the focal spot looks like. We have solutions for that also, but right now we're talking about power and energy measurement. The maximum power density or maximum energy density, well, let's focus on power focus. Let's look at power density. Um, the damage threshold depends among other things, and this is a really important point to be aware of, on the power level that we're talking about. Now, let me explain why that is. 
Here we have an absorber surface of some material. Let's say our typical thermal broadband absorber. Now let's say you've got a low power beam coming in. Here's the absorption spot. So as the beam's coming in, it, the light gets absorbed and is being turned into heat and the heat is propagating away. The spot where the absorption is happening is kind of hot and the area around the spot is sort of hot and as we move farther away, it becomes warm until it becomes cool. Um, here's a, from our th the thermal simulation software that our design engineers use when they're designing a sensor. Here you can see there's a small hot spot right at the absorption spot itself and as you move away from it, the temperature of the material you know, cools down the farther away you get. Now that same absorber material, let's say now we've got a high power beam coming in. So the absorption spot is not pretty hot, it's really hot. And a the area around it isn't sort of hot, it's still very, very hot. And as we move a decent distance away, it's not slightly warm, it's still quite hot because there's a whole lot more heat being generated here. So that same material, here's what the thermal profile of it looks like now. In a much larger area around the absorption spot, you've got a much higher temperature, which means the heat that's being generated here as the beam continues to come in has a much harder time getting out of the way. It'll take much fewer watts per square centimeter in the beam to heat this spot up to the point at which it's going to burn, even though it's the same material. So we specify our sensors with the maximum power density, with the damage threshold, depending on the maximum power for which a given sensor is rated. Um, so that even though it's the same material, for example, here's an excerpt. I hope you can see what it says here. Two different sensors, both of which use the same thermal broadband absorber that we have. One is a 10 watt sensor and one is a 250 watt sensor. So here the maximum average power density is 28 kilowatts per square centimeter. The same material, the same absorber here, it's rated at only 10, not 28, 10 kilowatts per square centimeter at 250 watts, 12 kilowatts per square centimeter at 150 watts. So because you're buying a 250 watt sensor, we're not gonna give you the nicer number just because it might sell more sensors and maybe in the fine print say, oh, but that's at 10 watts. If you're buying a 250 watt sensor, it's probably because you're gonna be measuring 100, 200, 250 watts. So that information, we try to make that, that as clear and helpful and useful and meaningful as possible. At very high power densities, remembering what we just said, the damage threshold would probably be pretty low. So we have some tricks that we use to enable high power sensors to nevertheless operate and handle higher power densities than they otherwise would be able to. I hope you can see here there's a gold coated cone here and what that does is it spreads the it reflects the beam outwards and spreads it and the absorber is not this the absorber is actually the cylindrical walls around the cone and what happens here is that by the time the beam reaches the walls it's been enlarged so the power density has been reduced okay cooling i need to pick up the pace here uh, for low power the the dissipation of heat just from the sensor's body into the air is good enough. Medium power, a couple tens of watts up to a couple hundred watts. We probably need to add a fan to force air over the sensor's body. And we add, here you'll notice we have what we call pin fins. It's an Ophir uh, proprietary design to maximize the heat dissipation. And at still higher powers, then we're already talking about water cooling. And then as we mentioned earlier, sometimes we can avoid water cooling for high power sensors by limiting the exposure to the high power to short exposure times, uh, intermittent measurements, in many cases, that's good enough. We've got a bunch of sensors that do that. We have a line of sensors, we call it beam track, that measure power as well as the beam position and in some cases also size at the same time. And this is what a typical output from an instrument would look like. You've got the power in watts, you've got the XY position of the beam centroid, and you've got the size. The size is an absolute measurement if the beam is a perfect Gaussian. If the beam is any other profile, this will be a relative number only, but in many cases that's good enough. You're aligning a beam in some complicated optomechanical system. You just need to know if the beam's getting bigger or smaller, moving into or out of focus as you tighten this knob, turn this screw, and this will tell you that, and also it'll show you a schematic. Um, and it'll also show you the history of where the beam is moving so you can get an idea of your pointing stability as well. We've got, I believe, seven models of these sensors. The basic idea is we introduce taps at four locations in the thermopile and the instrument will 
sample the signal at each of these four taps, and never mind the equation, not very complicated, but don't worry, it does it for you. And there's an additional detecting element in there that's not shown here for those models of beam track that also can measure size. Okay, for lower powers from picowatts, nanowatts, up to a couple hundred milliwatts, we use photodiodes. Here you've got a bunch of different photodiode sensors from our family. There's a wand configuration. There's the round configuration if you're dealing with like an optical table where the sensor needs to be centered over the mounting base and not you know, just sticking in from the side. There's one with a very thin profile if it needs to go into tight spaces um, and so on. Um, these are much faster physically. Um, they're much more sensitive. But on the other hand, they can't go up to nearly as high powers. They saturate. Um, to give them a more useful dynamic range, we add some attenuation, some basic built-in attenuation, and then a removable additional attenuation on top of that um, so that you can you know, get a reasonably useful dynamic range. The instrument, of course, needs to be told. It'll prompt you to select whether that outer filter is in or out. If you have it in, but you don't tell the instrument that, then you're going to get a wrong reading. These are not spectrally flat at all. It's a much, you know, because of the physics of photodiode sensors, semiconductors, it's a much more limited spectral range, and the spectral range, the spectral curve is not at all flat. So here, instead of being prompted to select a spectral region, you're prompted to select an explicit wavelength. Um, there is an angle dependence because the filters, in most cases, are absorptive which means that if the beam is coming in at an angle, it travels through a large, a longer optical path. So if you're measuring diverging beams, you need to take that into account. Um, some of the models have an ambient light canceling feature. It's two detectors back to back. Uh, the beam only goes onto one of them, but background light is seen equally by both of them. Um, when you're working at higher power, you add that external filter, then it blocks one of them. The assumption is that background light is generally pretty low. So if you're dealing at more than a couple milliwatts or a couple tens of milliwatts and upwards, then ambient light is probably irrelevant anyway. Uh, because of the physics of semiconductors, there is a temperature sensitivity. We've got graphs of that uh, in the data sheets. We have silicon, germanium, and in-gas detectors for different spectral ranges. And we've got a few special items. There's what called the BC20 barcode reader. It's got a peak hold circuit built in so you can measure the average power of a rapidly scanned beam where the beam is actually on the detector for only a small fraction of the time. A regular detector will give you a wrong reading because it's measuring average power. So here, the BC20 is meant especially for that. We've got one that is measures in photometric units, PD300CIE. And then we've got this thing here, MS Microscope Slide Detector, specifically designed for use in um, um, microscopy applications in, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, I hate when this happens, senior moment or tired moment, um, fluorescence microscopy. So this has the exact footprint of a microscope slide so that your experiments get actual numbers and are perfectly repetitive. Pyroelectric sensors, I really need to pick up the pace here. Um, for measuring energy per pulse of repetitively pulsed beams. Certain crystals, lithium niobate, others, I don't remember what crystal we use, but it's from that family, have a useful physical characteristic that when, when they're subjected to a mechanical stress, they momentarily uh, experience a separation of charges. I don't know if you can see this here, a whole bunch of little pluses on one side and a whole bunch of little minuses on the other side. It's mounted on a substrate and there's a whole bunch of electronics around it. So what happens is when a laser pulse gets absorbed, we put an, um, an electrode on each side of the crystal. So when a laser pulse gets absorbed, it gets turned into a heat pulse, which moves through the crystal and creates an acoustic pulse. There's your momentary mechanical stress. So you have a momentary separation of charges, which because of the electrodes and the electronics, we turn that into a momentary voltage pulse the voltage is proportional to the energy of the laser pulse that came in, and there's your measurement of pulse energy. Um, it's only momentary. We have all sorts of tricks in our electronics, so we can actually handle pulses in some cases as long as 20 milliseconds. That, you should know, is extremely long for one of these detectors, um, but it bleeds off at anything longer than that. Um, so pulse comes in, uh, 
and a measurement of energy goes out. We have different absorber types. In some cases, that metal electrode itself is a, a, a decent enough absorber. Other models, we add on top of that a broadband coating to broaden the spectral range, and it also gives it a better damage threshold. Again, there's always trade-offs. The sensor finder does most of the thinking for you. Uh, the maximum pulse rate for which a given sensor is rated depends on all kinds of things, um, depending on the physical design of the sensor and on the RC constant of the electronics. The rise time and fall time are characteristic. There's the electrical, well, the, the rise time basically depends on the thermal time constant for, the, for that heat pulse to move through the, through the crystal. The fall time depends on the thermal relaxation time and on the electronic, the RC constant. Again, I don't need to get into all the details, but there is a max. We have all kinds of tricks in the electronics. We measure the peak to valley, not the absolute, so we can handle even pretty fast pulses, but at the end of the day, you get to a maximum pulse rate. The specifications all make that very, very clear. Uh, again, this is just for appreciating the technical background. These are useful only for pulses. As I said, they don't respond to steady state at all. Uh, our fastest pyro sensors can measure every pulse at up to 25 kilohertz. Different sensitivities, different spectral response curves, and so on, depending on all the details. We have some sensors for the very lowest energies that are configured like energy sensors. They're actually based on photodiodes and not on pyroelectrics. That's all invisible to the user, uh, but it's just there. So those, instead of being called the PE9, PE25 pyroelectric, the names of these kind of give that away. They're called the PD10. Some of them are based on silicon. Some of them are based on geranium. Some of them are based on in-gas, again, depending on, on the needs. And again, the sensor finder will do the thinking, but just so that you'll appreciate what it's thinking about. So we have PD sensors that can measure all the way down to picojoules. And our pyro sensors can measure all the way up to tens of joules per pulse um, for repetitively pulse rates at up to whatever it is. Uh, absorber types I mentioned, sometimes just the metallic electrode itself. Uh, it can go faster, and but its spectral curve is not nearly as wide, and it's a little bit more delicate. We have two different broadband absorber coatings that we put on top of that in some models which have a much better spectral response and much better damage threshold because you've got a thicker layer, but they go slower. So for a couple hundred hertz, 25 kilohertz, and everything in between. Uh, if you need to work at higher energy densities, we have some models that have a fixed or removable diffuser, which, on it, which spreads the beam out a bit but before it reaches the absorber. If even that's not enough, if in your application you just can't find a location where the energy density is low enough, then we have a as an optional accessory, we have a beam splitter jig, which sends somewhere between 5 and 9%, I guess, of the beam into the center and passes the rest along. You might need a beam dump of some kind, unless you want to use your colleague for, one of your colleagues for that purpose. Um, and then that way you can measure still higher, you know, pulses with still higher energy densities. Uh, some CW applications involve powers that are too low for our thermal sensors. Even the most sensitive ones go down to maybe you know 10 microwatts. What if you need to measure a CW beam with less than 10 microwatts, maybe you know 100 nanowatts, but at a you know mid IR part of the spectrum where photodiode sensors don't work, and you don't want to have to buy an exotic, very expensive photodiode-based detector. Uh, so for that, for these gaps. We have what we call a radiometer. That word is used kind of loosely. Um, but the basic idea there, and we're talking about applications like terahertz or mid IR spectroscopy type of measurements, you know, down to nanowatts or something like that. The basic idea in a radiometer is that we use a chopper to chop, which basically means modulate the beam, and a pyro sensor, a pyroelectric sensor to measure the pulses. Um, and we have a lock-in amplifier built into the electronics, a digitally synthesized lock-in amplifier that ignores anything that's not at precisely the chopper frequency. In our case, that happens to be 18 hertz. And that way, we're bringing the noise down drastically. And using that, we can measure um, CW powers at all kinds of places in the spectrum, down to, in some cases, 100 nanowatts. In other cases, down to 300 femtowatts, if it's in a certain parts of the spectral range. We have some that are, we have one model designed for terahertz applications down to 100 nanowatts. 
that terahertz needs a suitable absorber. Our physicists developed our own proprietary absorber for terahertz. We've got some unique solutions for terahertz. This is what it looks like. Here's the chopper, here's the sensor, and it becomes a standard so-called smart sensor that works with any of our regular meters. Um, we've got some special solutions for measuring LEDs because there are special challenges involved there. Uh, we've got sensors for measuring the total flux. We've got a special line of solutions for LED luminaires. We're not really going to talk about that because it's a kind of a separate market. It's a separate industrial segment. But just you should know that we have a very interesting, very unique solution for that or family of solutions for the LED luminaire uh, industry for measuring dosage or irradiance in, in, let's say, the sort of applications involving, let's say, UV LEDs for sterilization or for UV curing and stuff like that. It's based on a round photodiode-based power sensor. It's got a built-in diffuser, and it directly measures the irradiance, the power density, or the, accum the cumulative energy density, or dosage. Uh, the d diffuser eliminates the angle effects, and these are calibrated over their full spectral range, which is for some reason, unusual uh, in that segment of the industry. So that's another interesting solution. For measuring total flux of these kind of powers of diverging beams, one usually uses an integrating sphere. We've got like three minutes left. The idea of an integrating sphere, you got a hollow ball, the inside of which is coated with a white reflective diffuse coating. Beam comes in, undergoes so-called an infinite number of reflections so that it gets uniformly distributed throughout the inside of the sphere. And then we sample part of the sphere by putting a detector there. And by knowing the ratio, the area of the detector and the area of the sphere, this is done automatically, of course, in, in the calibration. By measuring what the detector sees, we can then automatically apply a fully traceable calibration factor. And it gives a fully calibrated reading of the total power in the sphere. Tons of design considerations here. You don't want any direct line of sight between anything, any part of the beam that isn't perfectly distributed and the detector. So there's a baffle there. In most spheres, we have some additional ports for sampling the light out to additional sensor types, like a spectrometer, like a temporal pulse shape uh, sensor, and that sort of thing. Sometimes integrating spheres are used with collimated beams to take advantage of the possibility of multiple sampling ports or to reduce the power and power density on the detector so you can use it with fast sensors, which would be challenging to do otherwise. We've got a whole section of our website dealing with that. For example, Vixel applications have to face those challenges a lot. Um, here's a six inch integrating sphere. There are four ports in it. Um, we've got all sorts of accessories that can be configured for widely diverging beams, for collimated beams. We've got special port adapters for all the different types of applications. Some of the adapters are white and diffuse. Some of them are actually black and highly absorptive. Again, all of this is explained on our website. Uh, we can't really get into that now. Uh, I mentioned temporal pulse shape detectors. We've got a family of five of those. Uh, these are based on fast photodiodes, and they send out the signal to a third-party instrument, typically an oscilloscope. Some of them are in gas, some of them are silicon, UV in enhanced silicon, picoseconds to nanoseconds, various spectral range. Just a couple words about meters before we conclude. Um, our standard sensors, the calibration data and other data, are all stored on an EEPROM at a, inside the connector at the end of the sensor cable. And that D15 connector, we call that the smart connector that's got all the data in it. Our instruments have a mating D15 connector. And as soon as a meter meets a sensor, it automatically reads all of that data. And then it knows how to work with that sensor. It knows what the calibration factors are. It knows what, to, what you know, menus to prompt the user with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the meter receives an analog output that's coming from the, detect the raw detector element reads here all the data it needs to know, and then it can get to work. And then it displays the readout on a handheld display. It might display it on a screen. Some of the instruments are direct to PC interfaces, and we have um, USB-based and an RS-232-based standard software that can run on your PC to do all the work. So the PC becomes a display. We also have a very extensive um, range of OEM capabilities so that you can use your own software. You can integrate a sensor with its own independent electronics inside your host system, perhaps. Um, our standard uh, instruments come with a full suite 
of uh, LabVIEW, uh, all sorts of other tools to be able to communicate from within your own system with our instrument uh, using a COM object that comes built into our standard uh, software package. Um, huh. Okay, here we are. So in summary, we had a look at the mostly at the sensor end of the system. We mentioned briefly, very briefly, the processing and the different options for output. Sometimes the output's to a human user, sometimes it's to an onboard system controller. We talked about what we measure, why we measure, and most of, most of our discussion was about how we measure. Uh, I just mentioned that I'm gonna end off by showing you, pointing you in the direction of further information. I'm gonna do that right now. I'm just gonna briefly share my screen. Um, share web browser, here we are. The Ophir Photonics Group homepage. If you go to Support Knowledge Center, that's where you wanna go. Um, there's a bunch of videos, articles, power and energy FAQs, all sorts of beam profiler stuff, all sorts of downloads. If you basically go to search, then you can search for pretty much anything. It, you can filter that search. We've got tons and tons of articles here, articles about how we arrive at the you know, absolute accuracy specification, error trace, you know, error propagation, the traceability. Um, articles on, on everything. Um, if I start going through that now, then I'm gonna go way beyond our time. Right now, I believe we're at exactly 60 minutes. So, okay, I, I need a hot drink now, but uh, I'll do that on my time. All right, if you have any questions you wanna ask online, I got a few more seconds to do that. This is my email address, mark.slutsky at ophirops.com. I'm gonna leave this up for a couple of minutes. My name is Mark Slutsky, product manager for power and energy measurement solutions here at the Ophir Photonics Group. I hope this was helpful. I hope it was not too fast, not too slow, not too deep, not too shallow. I hope this was a good Goldilocks. I hope I struck the right balance. Um, you can contact me directly. You can contact us through our website, um, through our partners, whatever you want. I hope this was helpful. Dare I say, maybe even interesting. Um, thank you very much for being with us. Have a very nice rest of the day.